Hallelujah. Good evening, good evening, good evening, Central. This is the day the Lord has made, and we choose to rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. Praise God. Just want to say thank you all for all the, all the cards and letters, and thank you for the, the appreciation. We feel appreciated. Amen. Now, our job here tonight is to make sure the Lord feels appreciated. Amen. Amen. That we are thankful. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye land, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that he is God. It is he that is. Anyway, I think I just messed that up. But be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And what endures? His truth endures throughout all generations. Stand to your feet tonight, please. Amen. Father, we love you and thank you for this day. And Holy Ghost, I just ask you to just show yourself strong. Lord, as we gather in this place tonight to worship you, to hear your word, and Lord, to pray. I pray tonight for, for Father God, the, 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 many, the many requests that have been made here tonight. For that young boy with, with uh, hydrocephalus. Lord, I thank you for touching and healing his brain. I thank you for touching Sister Brenda tonight. Lord, as she's on her way to the hospital with uh, unusually high blood pressure, God, touch that woman. And Lord, all of the needs in this place tonight, we're going we're gonna to gather around these altars and we're going to call out. And Lord, your word says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Lord, you said you would hear, that you would forgive, and you would heal. And Lord, we're asking you to do that tonight. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said a great, big, loud, enthusiastic, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, some glad morning when this life is over.
Give glory. 
give him glory. I give glory to your name. Oh, Lord, I sing praises to your name. Oh, Lord, for your name is great. For your name is great and great. I sing praises to your name. Oh, Lord, praises to your name. Oh, Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. For you Sorororo, 
Come on. Rectele ma ronda saki ara mara la mash. Je ne sais quel est mon loro de vos. Bela mara satala la baki ara mara de loro de vos. Gera mara satala la bazon de loro de vos. Bela mari ki le mendeshe se le mandos. Ora rama ki te la mari de veshes. Bela mandos. It's your prayer tonight. Feel this place with your glory. Feel this place. Come on, sing it again. Feel this place. Lord, feel this place. Let your presence, Holy Spirit, feel. Ephesians 1. Lord, give us, grant to this, to this church fresh revelation in the knowledge of Jesus the Christ. God, we want to know you. We want to see you. But we want to just hear about you. Mighty God. Mighty God. Mighty God. Abba, Father. Oh, 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 let the love of God flood this house tonight. Abba, the love of a Father. Holy Spirit, manifest this presence. Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory to God. Lord, your word says they that hunger and thirst for righteousness would be filled. You told us they that seek you would find you. So, Master, tonight we're hungry. We're hungry for you. Lord, we're hungry not just for a personal experience, but, God, that you would come and manifest your glory to this nation again, to the church first. Lord, we've got to see you rightly. So I do pray, Lord, that it start with us, but God, don't let it end with us. Let it flow. Out the, let your glory flow out of the threshold of this temple. Lord, into, this, into the streets. And let the river of the Spirit, the, 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 the further out we get into this culture, into this generation, let us find that the river of the Spirit is growing deeper, that there's ample supply. Lord, you are God of more than enough. 
And your word says you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so, Lord, we simply trust you. We take you at your word and we say thank you, Jesus, for showing yourself strong. In Jesus' mighty name, the church said amen, amen, amen. Give him a hand clap of praise. I tell you, I don't know where we would be without these guys on this platform. Guys, I can't tell you thank you enough. A pivotal part of what God is doing here. And thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Number one weapon. Amen. Thank you. Yes. Hallelujah. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of talk in Christian circles about revelation, revelation, revelation. And I've been meditating on this this week. Man, look who I see sitting back there. God bless you, buddy. Good to see you. I always get you sushi or yogi. I never know which one you are. Huh? I know, Josh. What did they call you back in the day? Uh, they called him something. Oh, the other one, Sushi? Okay. That's Josh. All right, Josh. Good to see you, brother. Hallelujah. There's a lot of talk about, about Revelation this, Revelation that, and I, I've just been meditating and chewing on this. And, and you know, if, if we were to have an actual, genuine revelation of God, it would rock your world. And I want us to look at that tonight. And, uh, and, and then we're going to come pray around this. The, the first, the fir number one, the first thing we want to say is that a genuine revelation is, is, is an awareness of the awfulness of God. Awful. A-W-E. That it should fill you with an awe. A holy awe that God is, is, is altogether other than what we are, than what I am. Amen. That, that, that we're filled with awe. When you, when you let your mind really love God and you start thinking about who He is and what He does, it, it just, man, it, it just, uh, it, it'll take you down rabbit trails that, uh, that you're going to find hard to get away from. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, I want you to look at that. This is the first encounter we see of, a, of, a, of, of when, when the human had a revelation. You know, when God created man... There was no revelation needed. He woke, it's like, it's like a baby doesn't have to be introduced to mama, right? You know, because baby grows up with mama, right? You know, and, uh, you know, they, they say, now I, I don't, I, I can't prove this, but that there can be, you know, 20 babies in the nursery and, and, and 100, 100 people in the church house. That one baby starts crying. That mama in here knows it's, that's, that's mine. The mama knows the baby's crying. Now, I know all you women say that's true. I, I can't prove that, but <laughs> all these women about to hang me. We can, okay, I'll take your word for it. I believe you. But, folks, I want you to know, you know, God created Adam, and, and Adam knew nothing but God. Now, just please help me. Just kind of unplug from your previous theological teaching and experience. Un unplug from that and just let your mind go there, you know, to, to the day of creation. God creates Adam. Adam opens his eyes, and he knows nothing but God. Wow. Never knew shame. Never knew fear. Ne never knew failure. He knows nothing but, but the, the manifest glory of God. We're going to dig into that a little bit. Genesis 3, 8. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord. They did what? They heard the Lord God walking about in the garden, and so they hid from the Lord God among the trees. So again, I want you to imagine never having known anything but the love and the intentionally focused attention uh, from Father God. You never knew fear, shame, regret, pain, remorse. You knew none of that. And all of a sudden, when you hear the voice of God coming, amen, it strikes something in you that you've never known, a fear. They've never known it. But all of a sudden it shows up. Adam had walked with the spirit beings as well as with God. Amen. We, we can say angels if your mind can't 
hadn't really wrapped itself around the whole dimension of that unseen realm. There's more than angels. There's seraphim and cherubim and, 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 and for creatures and zoe and four-headed, not four-headed, one head with four faces on it and, you know, things that are flying and stuff that's moving and wheels in the middle of wheels and eyes everywhere. Come on. And Adam is walking in all that stuff and he knows no fear. He, he, he doesn't even know wonder. He just thinks this is normal. It is. He's just walking. This is just normal. He, he occupies, listen to me, he occupies a place that is so other than the place you and I occupy, he, he is occupying a, a place in the spiritual domain where he has authority on the earth and in the unseen, what we call the unseen realm, but for him at the time, it was totally seen. Unlike the created beings, Adam had authority in both places. And it's just normal. And he's just walking until the day that a question came in his mind. He began to question the character and the integrity of his father. And when he questioned the character, did God really say? In church, we, that most of the church lives in that place. Most of the church lives in the place. I know his word says, but... Most of us live there. Adam did not. He lived in a place where he just simply took it at face value until one day when the enemy came and planted a seed of doubt and rebellion. You know, we call it sin or falling. But what it is, it's a rebellion against the known, revealed will of God. And the next time he heard the voice of God, he had a revelation. What is a revelation? A revelation is an unveiling of, of, of one of the facets of God that you've never known before. And so suddenly he has this revelation of the terribleness, the awfulness of God, the fear of God. And the Bible says he and his wife, they hid. God says, where are you, Adam? It's like, I, I was afraid. Well, God knew. Whoa, whoa, time out. Who, who told you? I know the Bible says, you know, who, who told you you were naked? But I believe before that conversation started, God knew the way it was said. What do you mean fear? What do you have to fear? God didn't give you that. It's a good word. I'll preach that. <laughs> God, no, no, help me. I like, I like that. God didn't give you a spirit of fear. The word says that. But love, power, and a sound mind. I was afraid. What were you afraid of? How did you know fear? Where did that come from? It's not, it did not come from the Father. It did not come from this intimate oneness. So at, as a, in his fallen state, he had a revelation. There's another side to this God. Come on. We're going to see this in the scriptures again and again and again. Now, when man in his fallen state has a divine encounter, it produces something other than just, oh, come on. I, I just, I, I really get hung up on this fact that Adam lived in a place where there was no shame and no regret, no remorse, no pain, no fear, just an awareness of the love of God. He never thought that before the fall, he never thought that having access and authority in both the seen and the unseen world, that it was out of his reach, that he was, he was not able, he was inferior. There was no insecurity. Hello? That God could not be approached, that God did not somehow want this for him, never entered his mind. Until rebellion came in. <clears throat> Suddenly being confronted with your own betrayal of this being that has only shown you love and affirmation. When you betray that love and that affirmation, you hear the voice of God and you hide. Is that right? Come on, stay with me tonight. I know this is, the, I'm going to take you somewhere. In Genesis 28, Genesis 28 verse 16. Adam was not the only one. Jacob 
awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord, he just had a dream. Surely the Lord is in this place, and I wasn't even aware of it. But he was also afraid and said, What an awesome, that's all filled place this is. This is none other than the house of God, the very gateway to heaven. Jacob, in his, in, in, folks, let me tell you something. In your heart of hearts, you know you were created to walk with God. You and I have been created to walk in that spirit realm, amen, where, where the, 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 the beings of God are there. And we were created to have authority both here and there. That's why Jesus said, what you bind on earth is bound in the heavenlies. Come on, there is this, there is this place where God, if not, what did the, the, the serpent see in man that he wanted? He wanted our place of dominion, wanted our place of authority. And so by, through sin, he brings fear and condemnation and, a, and, a, and a, almost a revolting from the presence of God. That's not the design. That's not the desire of God. Amen? Jacob was a deceiver and a flim-flam man. Due to his, why was he that way? He was insecure. Now, some of us can read between the lines. His brother was a big hulking man's man. He was a hunter. He was hairy. That's what it says. <laughs> he was a hairy dude. And Jacob was a little bit softer. And for some reason, it brought insecurities and fear into his life. And so he began to learn to, to scheme and connive to get what he wanted. Esau could just go whoop you and take what he needed. Jacob had to, had, had to, had to flim-flam you. Come on. And so when he, he, he's, he's fleeing from his, bro, his, his brother after stealing the birthright, and he's going to his uncle Laban's house, and he, he lays down his head on a rock, and he has a dream of angels ascending and descending. Come on. It is this call to the supernatural that he's encountering. He's like, ah, this is a house of God, and it struck fear in his heart. But yet he was created to live there. If we could just get this tonight. There's another one in Exodus chapter 3, verse 5. Exodus 3, 5. Don't come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Look at it. When Moses heard this, what did he do? He covered his face. Why? Because he was afraid to look at God. Adam walked with God with no fear, with no condemnation. And since the fall, every time a human comes into an encounter, a revelation of the, of the, of the awfulness of God, they fear. And, and they, 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 they're like, oh, God, I've seen his face. I'm going to die. I want to tell you the devil is a liar. Amen. What the church needs today is a fresh revelation of God. Through these, kinds, uh, through these kinds of God encounters, there comes a holy fear. Uh, and, and folks, it's never, and, and an awe, and it's never repulsive. When, when the believer comes into the presence of God, it'll put you on your face, but it won't cause you to run backwards. It shouldn't. Amen. It's, it's not repulsive. A true revelation of God does not cause a man to run from him. Rather, it causes the man to draw near to him. A genuine revelation will stir up a divine curiosity in you. Isaiah 6, we see Isaiah. He sees into the throne. He says, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up. His train filled the temple, right? And, and, and he's, he's like pulling back the veil, and he's looking, and he sees the seraphim flying, and, the and, and he hears the refrain, holy, holy, holy. And he's like, wow, wow. And he said, what's the first thing that came out of his mouth? Woe is me. What's that? He realizes he's not fit for that temple, but he wanted to be. Come on. 
You see, if there's a divine curiosity in your heart and in my heart, amen, we're going to, we, we, and we have a revelation of God. It's why we worship like we do. We, I, we worship, we strive to host the presence of God here, amen? We strive for the Holy Ghost to show up and to manifest himself among us. Why? Because I want men and women that come in this church to have that kind of an encounter. I want them to bump into the presence of God, and then I want that encounter to produce in them, oh gosh, oh no, I, I got to do something with this. There, there, there's an uncleanness here. Church, if you, if you encounter the living presence of God, there will be that, that knowledge that, that, oh, Jesus, let me get to an altar somewhere. I've got to get, how can I get rid of this uncleanness? And it's not meant to repulse you. <laughs> Amen. The very conviction is an invitation. Because immediately God responds. He says, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And an angel goes, and he, with the tongs, he could have grabbed it with his hand. Not an angel, it's a seraphim. He, and he took the coal off, of an, off the altar. What's that represent? The sacrifice. That fire's burning. Amen. You know, everybody focuses on tongues. But there's more to the baptism of the Holy Ghost than tongues. There ought to be a fire. There ought to be a, oh, oh not my fuego. Ah! No, it's something that puts you on your face that says, oh, God, there's something in me that's out of kilter. Please get me right. And that was Isaiah's cry. Seraphim flies over, said, here, this has touched your lips. You're clean now. Then he hears his voice. Whom? Shall we sin and who will go for us? And now he's no longer afraid because the invitation to revelation has brought him to an encounter. And he says, here am I, Lord, send me. That is what you as a believer should be striving for when you come into the house of God. God, you search my heart. You get anything in here that's not right. If it's an attitude, if it's, if it's whatever it is, God, get, get, cleanse my lips, cleanse my heart, make me right so that I can then hear your voice and not be repulsed by it, not want to run and hide from you. Folks, God's not trying to, to scare you. You know, we, we talk about the fear of God and the uninitiated think, you know, that that means we're afraid God's going to hit us with a sledgehammer and, 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 and smash us like a bug. That's not it. The fear ought, is, is this holy awe. You know, when the, when the Pentecostal revival started in 1906, they weren't up front praying, God, give me tongues. Did you know that? You need to go back and read it. They, their, their theology was a little off. They, were, they believed in the second blessing of, of entire sanctification. And they were down front praying, God, <laughs> sanctify me. Make me holy. And God's response was, the only way I can do that is to fill you with my spirit. <laughs> Come on. And so they'd be upstairs repenting for hours or days or weeks until the fire fell. Come on, until they opened up and received. And now we won't get them up here in five minutes and get them to talk in tongues and say, now you've been filled. Let me tell you something. If you're going to have a God encounter, it's going to shift everything in your life. It's not just going to change your tongue. It's going to change the way you walk. It's going to change the way you talk. It's going to change everything about your life. What this world needs is a church that has had such an encounter with Christ. That we're not just, we don't just have tongues, but we've been We've been touched with, a, with a, a, a coal off of that altar. Somebody say amen. Amen. God chooses for some things to remain a mystery so that we'll continue to search it out. And when you read men that have had these kind of God encounters, I think about Moses. Moses is, is walking down there, but minding his own business, chasing these sheep. And I preached this a while back, and he sees the burning bush. And there was a divine curiosity that, that drove him to, to take a closer look. 
And church, I, I think sometimes we become, we become too familiar with the presence of God and we do not allow his presence to produce in us a divine curiosity that God, is there anything that's too hard for you to do? I might have been rest. I've been saved for 45 years, but there's something in here that's still got a hold of me. Is there something that I can do to get a little closer, to get close enough to you where I will be made like you? That divine curiosity will cause you to push further than your neighbor will. That divine curiosity will get you to get up out of your chair and come to an altar, even if the man of God didn't finish preaching. Come on. It'll cause you to move and do things that are strange. God, give us some Hannahs that will pray. Come on. That will pray until God births something within their own life. Come on, church. I need some Hannah's up at this altar praying, God, give me his children or I die. You don't hear that cry in the church anymore. We're like we're content to let them go to hell if they don't want to get saved. Amen. But the church ought to be up here weeping between the porch and the altar like Joel says. Saying, spare thy people, O God. There ought to be a cry of Hannah saying, God, give me children. Give me sons, give me daughters, or I die. We need to see some Jacobs down at the altar wrestling with God until they receive the promised blessing. Come on, and I need some Moseses down here crying out to God, I want to see you. Oh, I love reading those verses. I love reading the <laughs> Moses has spent more time in the presence of God. Listen to me. Moses had spent more time in the presence of God than any human since Adam. Knew him face to face. Talked to him like a friend. Nobody in history from Adam until Moses came had ever spent the kind of time and intimacy that Moses did. And then he cries out, but I want to see you. <sighs> Folks, that's what we're going to If you make heaven, if I make heaven, we're going to walk the same streets of gold with Moses. And he's going to look at you and me, and we're going to talk about, oh, what, are, what encounters we had with God. Really? Was that a real revelation? Because if you had a real revelation, you would, you would have pressed a little harder, gone a little farther, and <laughs> dove a little deeper. So my prayer tonight is that God give us a genuine revelation. I want, I want the church, that this world needs a church that has a genuine revelation of who he is. That God will pull back the veil, but when he does, he doesn't just, you know, open it up and say, boo, here I am. It, 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 it pleases the Lord to conceal a thing. The heart of a king will search it out. He'll crack the door just a little bit. Let, let a little bit of light shine to see, do you have a spiritual curiosity to, that will cause you to, to, is there a hunger in your heart for Jesus? Now, yeah, sometimes there are circumstances that push us there. Amen? 9-11 uh, was one of those. A lot of folk come in church houses praying the, the day after. Come on. We had prayer meetings. We had, we had all kinds of stuff going on after 9-11. Because, because fear, not fear of God, but fear of an uncertain future pushed men to come and seek God. That's not curiosity. You hear me? I, I, want, you to, I want you to measure your, your, your spiritual curiosity tonight. I want you to take a, take a measure of yourself. Is there something that beats in my heart that says, I just, I, I want to know him? You know, or, or, we, or do we serve him for what we can get out of it? You know, well, I'm sick and I need a healing, so I'll go to church. Y'all are here on Wednesday night, so I'm preaching to the choir here, talking to these folks that are online. That's, and I'm always messing with y'all. I'm just use you as a foil so I can talk to folks. Amen. But is there a, a divine curiosity in us that makes us pursue his presence? Mo that Moses had spent 40 years in what he thought was a wasted life, 
But in that 40 years, God had worked in Moses' character, crucified his pride. Amen? The, the, the man from Pharaoh's court who killed Egyptians and, you know, was going to be the hero and the deliverer suddenly gets to where he can't even talk. Called, the meek by, called by, by God himself the meekest man on the earth. And that's not weakness. Meekness is not weakness. <laughs> Amen. Just look at him. I mean, he, he, he threw himself between God and Israel more than once. If you're going to take them out, start with me. <laughs> that, ain't, that ain't weakness. Hallelujah to God. Amen. There's got to be something in us at these altars crying out to God, I want to see you. The scripture in Revelation, I, I believe, is, is, is being fulfilled in our day right now that, that where it says Satan realizes that he has but a short time. Come on, all hell is breaking loose, not just in Israel and other places, but I mean right here, uh, in, right, right here in Brazoria County this morning. Thank God it was a false alarm. But uh, I, I got a phone call from Gabby, and then I got a text from uh, Anthony and Amy that uh, they had a they had a uh, a, a false alarm for a, a, an active shooter at at Brazoria High, Brazoswood High School, and uh, you know Gabby Gabby called me and said, "Would you pray with me?" You know, because her husband's there, and and people from this church are there, and, and so man, we're praying and praying and praying, and and as I'm praying, I'm reminded of what I preached Sunday. Unless the Lord keep the city. Unless the Lord keep the city, the watchman can do his thing, but it's all in vain. Are you hearing me? Folks, we need God. I said we need God. We need him in our lives. We need him in our city. We need him in our schools. And so there's got to be somebody at an altar somewhere saying, God, have mercy on this nation. And I begin to cry, Lord, <clears throat> You're keeping this city. I, we had to take our place. I, 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 just, I just felt like I needed to, to take my place this morning, and I did. Amen. Thank God it was a false alarm. I want you to, what, one more verse here. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time because I want us to spend more time in prayer tonight. In, in Revelation chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1. <clears throat> and let's start in verse 10, Revelation 1.10. It was the Lord's day. And I was worshiping how? I was worshiping how? In the spirit. What does that mean? He wasn't just singing songs. He wasn't going through the motions. He was tapping into the Holy Ghost. You hear me? He was tapping into the spirit life that was deposited on him, the same life that raised Jesus from the dead that God had deposited in John, and he's deposited that same spirit inside your heart and inside my heart. Come on, are you hearing me? The same spirit, and, and Paul will say, if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you, he will give life to your mortal body. And so John says, I was not just going through the Sunday uh, 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 ritual, but I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. If I said, right now, right now, everybody get, get in the spirit, what would you do? How would you do that? How do, you, how do you know how to have access to the Spirit? How do, you, how do you know how to get in to the Spirit? John knew, and because he knew, he had a revelation. And so if, we, if the church, we're saying that the church needs a fresh revelation of God so that this world can see who God is and, and develop a fear and an awe of him that will not repulse them but will attract them, amen, if that's, then the, if that's going to happen, then the church has got to worship in the Spirit. Jesus told the woman at the well, the Father is looking for worshipers who know how to do two things, who will worship me in spirit and in truth. Come on, there's a time for the truth. There's a time for preaching the truth. But then there's a time to allow that truth to begin to manifest in your life. Come on, y'all. Amen. This, there is life in his word. I said there's life in his word. And if we will give vent to that, give it permission to change us and shape us. Uh, this is a sword. 
It's a carving, it's a spiritual carving knife. And the intent is that this word will, will challenge you. If, if, if it doesn't challenge you when you open it up, then you're not worshiping in spirit. But if you're in the spirit and you open this book, it will point to you. Every single one of you in this room tonight, the word of God will point to you and say, you need to change this. Or you can't come near. See, when we read it, there's a revelation. That revelation is first personal. Woe is me. But then, it's not a revelation that, that repulses you, that pushes you out. It's a revelation that invites you in. It's a revelation that says, I want you to approach me, but you don't come willy-nilly. Moses said, I'm going to turn around and turn aside and see this great sight. And he just starts walking right on up there. And God says, no, you stop right there, boy. You take those shoes off. It's where you're about to step into something and you had never walked in before. <sighs> Forty years you've been chasing uh, sheep on the backside of this desert. I'm about to show you something you've never seen. I've seen everything in 40 years. I've seen mountain lions come out. I've seen babies born. I've seen old, old goats die. I've seen it all. What do you mean you go to come? You're about to go somewhere. You're about to, there is still something you don't know. And the burning attracted him. And as he began to move in God's direction, God said, stop right there. you gotta, you got to get those shoes off. Isaiah, oh, woe is me. Are you with me tonight? The revelation of God, first of all, is going to point to you. Let's get some stuff straight here. Let's get some stuff straight here. Yeah, you're called and yeah, you're anointed, but you ain't all that in a box of chocolates. You're going to have to deal with some things. Every single human tonight, especially in the, in the United States of America, we must allow the Word of God to deal with us. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And I was worshiping in spirit. In the, it was the Lord's Day and I was worshiping in the Spirit. And suddenly I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast. And it doesn't say that he ran or he hid. Why? Because he's worshiping in the spirit. <laughs> because he's being transformed by the word of God, by the spirit of God. Come on. And you can hear his voice when you're walking in the spirit. I said you can hear his voice when you're walking in the spirit. He said, I heard a voice like the trumpet blast. And it said, write in a book everything you see and send it to the seven churches in the cities of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergam, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And when I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven gold lampstands. And standing in the middle of the lampstands, that's the churches, was someone like the Son of Man. And he was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest, and his head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were flames of fire. His feet were polished like bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. And he held seven stars in his hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was like the sun in all of its brilliance. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. But he laid his right hand on me. His what hand? His right hand. That's the, that's the seat of power. He laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. Come on, church. There wasn't nobody before me. There won't be anybody after me. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever. Come on, who's, who is talking? This is Jesus, the resurrected Christ. This is the Christ, the eternal Son of God. And I hold the keys. Who holds the keys? Jesus, the one inviting John into this revelation. The one inviting John, don't, he's saying, no, no, don't be afraid. 
Don't run off, John. Don't go hide from me, John. Don't be like your ancestor, Adam. Amen. Be like the last Adam. Come on, y'all. Amen. I died so that you could have access to the presence of God. So don't let the, the presence cause you to repeal or repulse or to, to retreat. Oh, John, don't be afraid because I am, I have, what did he say? He said, I hold the keys of death in the grave. Somebody ought to say, thank God that John, amen, pressed in a little farther than his contemporaries. John didn't give up when all of the, the, the other 11 were already martyred and in the grave. Amen. John held faithful. Come on. He didn't quit in his day of adversity. When the troubles came, they boiled him. Uh, uh, tradition says they, they tried to kill him by boiling him in oil, and he wouldn't die. And so they, 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 they banished him to this island. Amen. We're going to put you somewhere where even God can't find you. And he said, I'm going to worship in the Spirit on the Lord's day anyway. Amen. And as he's worshiping, amen, in the Spirit, God shows up and said, I've got the keys of death. Woo! Come on, y'all. Adam allowed fear. I, I never read in here where Adam repented, where he said, God, forgive me. He just acknowledged the fact that he was afraid. He acknowledged the damage that was done as a result of his rebellion, but he never repented. Come on, church. That's the difference between Adam and you. <laughs> Amen. Well, that last Adam gives us the ability to repent. Let me tell you, if you don't repent, there is no hope for you. I can't help you. I'm not going to waste time on somebody that won't own their stuff and come and say, Father, forgive me. Amen. Pastor, will you talk to my drug-addicted son or daughter? I, there ain't no sense in talking to them if they, don't, if they don't repent. Are you listening to me? That, that they're in rebellion and a, re a rebel has nothing to do with God. What your job is, is their mama, their daddy, their grandma, grandpa, their friend. You need to pray that the God of this world who has blinded their minds, that that, that blindness be released, that their eyes are open, their ears are open, and they hear the voice of their father. Oh, Jesus. That takes the heart of a, of a Moses. It takes the heart of a, of a uh, uh, whatever that girl's name was. Hannah, thank you, of Hannah crying out, Samuel's mama, give me a son or I die. Eli thought she was drunk. Why? Because nobody prayed like that. Because she wasn't following protocol. It's too early in the morning for you to be drunk, woman. She said, sir, you see, he was spiritually blind. So, son, you don't understand. I'm not drunk. In the anguish of my heart, I've cried out to my God. Why? Why was she doing that? Because she knows she had an audience. She knew that God would listen to her. She knew God was not trying to stiff arm her and keep her from something that he told her she could have. In her heart of hearts, she knew this is mine. Come on, church. The church of Jesus Christ has got to get to the place to where we will, we will trust God again, where we will believe him again, and, and, and we, will, we will cry out to him again. Sister Ralphina called me uh, or, or texted me this afternoon on my drive home and asked me to pray for uh, uh, Sister Brenda George. Her, her blood pressure is up to, what, 220 or something. It was some crazy number. And, uh, and, and they're taking her by ambulance to the hospital. And so I'm texting back. I'm dictating. And so, so Siri doesn't talk in tongues very well. But, but I told her. I said, after I told her some other things, I said, the devil is a liar. And the Lord just began to speak. I said, the devil is a liar. And greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. It is time to pray into a genuine 
fresh revelation of the risen Jesus. The manifestation of the word of the living God is about to be birthed upon this earth. It will produce healing, but it's not going to be a healing revival. It will produce the fullness of the Spirit, though not a Holy Ghost revival. It will produce millions of salvations, though it's not going to be a third great awakening. What we are about to experience, no one before us has ever experienced. The unregulated, real power power of the living God is about to flow through a consecrated church and we're going to pray for a genuine revelation of who he is. I said we're going to pray tonight for a genuine revelation of God to be birthed in the heart of the church. A revelation that will produce a holy fear and an awe of the one who sits on the throne. That's what the church needs. That's what your family needs. Your family, let me tell you something. You can protest. You can, uh, you can order, and you ought, to be, you ought to be buying more bullets. Glory to God. Amen. If, you go, if you're going to lean to the arm of the flesh, you better, you better get your stockpiles built up. But that ain't going to do it. Come on. <laughs> That's not going to accomplish the purpose of God. Let me tell you something. This, this is not over yet. I hadn't heard, I hadn't heard his voice saying, come up here. When we hear that call saying, come up here, then it's over. But until that moment, friend, you are still the head and not the tail. Until that moment, the greater one is living on the inside of you and me. Until that moment, God has got you here in season, on time, in the right place, in the right time. And he expects, he demands that you manifest his glory. You can't do that without a revelation. First of all, revelation is personal. Amen. You need you. You and I tonight. I'm not. I'm using a lot of use tonight. My psychologist wife would tell me, "Don't do that." Say we, softer that way. It is, but I'm still going to talk to you. But when I'm talking to you, I'm talking to me. Amen. We need a personal revelation, where where God will burn. Amen. That's in Matthew. You know, uh, John said. He said, I baptize you with water, but there's coming one who is mightier than I am, and he will baptize you. He will put you into the Holy Ghost, and he'll put you into fire. And, and, and you know, we Pentecostals want to stop right there and, and interpret what the fire is. Don't do that. Let John interpret it. He said, whose fan is in his hand. And he's going to thoroughly purge his floor. What's he talking about? Going to blow the chaff off of the wheat. And the chaff then is going to be gathered and burned. So you've got to read the whole thing to understand what the fire is for. The fire is to burn the stuff out of your life that God allowed for a season. God, uh, listen to me, church. Listen. God allows the chaff to remain intact while the wheat grows. And when the wheat gets to the point where it is ready to be mature, the chaff begins to loosen its grip. But it takes the wind to blow the chaff off so that the wheat can be usable. As long as the chaff is there, the wheat is not usable. Come on, y'all. <laughs> I don't want to eat no bread that's got chaff still in it. It's not digestible. You chew on it and it gets stuck in your teeth. Oh, that's good bread. No, no. It, 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 was, it wasn't finished. God wants to blow some stuff off of you. The church, he's talking to, he said, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Whose fan is in whose hand? Jesus. He's the one going to do it. And you're wondering, why is all of this trouble blowing my way? Maybe, honey, he's trying to blow some chaff off of your life, some things. He allowed for a season, but that season is over. Amen. He's allowed you to be a, a, a little childless and immature for a while. That season is over. It's time to come up and be a full-grown man or woman. It's time to stand up and say, you know what? I know what God's got me here for. Come on. It's time to allow the purpose of God, the wind of the Spirit. Oh, yeah, it's about the, I love the doodads, but it ain't about the doodads. It's about making you, fashioning you into his purpose. 
So my prayer tonight is that the church will allow that revelation. First, it's a personal revelation. Second, it is a revelation for the nation. <laughs> Here's the coal. That's personal. Burn, you know, your sins have been purged. You're good. But the very next thing is that we hear his voice. And it doesn't tell us about how wonderful we are. It just, it presents the issue out here. There's a world out here that needs a church that's on fire. Who are we going to send? Where are we going to find such a church? Where are we going to find such a people? Where are we going to find a human that will put my needs above their own needs? That will put their, the needs of the others above their own needs? Isaiah, that heart of Isaiah said, here am I, Lord. I'm here. Send me. That's what God's after tonight, y'all. I know there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of heavy stuff going on here. Amen. <laughs> and we're, we, we should have sang that song tonight. When the battle's over, we shall wear a crown. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I, there ain't no crown for you yet. You, as long as you're breathing and on top of the dirt, there's a fight for you to fight. There's a battle to be fought. Amen. This is not a, a playground. This is a battleground. I know I've said it before. i say it again. It is time for us to get up and fight the fight of faith. So I want you to pray with me tonight. We're going to fill these altars up. And I want us to ask God, God, give us a fresh, a genuine, not, not, not this modern-day revelation. Again, I want you to forget what, what you know about this word revelation. Revelation is unveiling, where we begin to see things that we've never seen before. Amen. If we're gonna if we're gonna see God move in this generation, it's it's gonna take something more than what what we've had. Come on. Why what Pastor, why do you say that? Because we've been doing what we what we've been doing. And this world is going to hell faster today than it was ten years ago. That tells me the church, the church needs to pray her way and repent her way through to a fresh unveiling of the glory of God. Let it speak to you first. And once he's done dealing with you, he's going to use you for the nations. Amen. Get, guys, if you'll put some the worship pads on, if you will. Father, I thank you. Why don't you stand with me tonight? Just lift your hands. Father God, we thank you for your presence here tonight. Holy Ghost, I believe I heard you, and I delivered exactly what you wanted me to deliver tonight. And Lord, whether it's for this congregation or other congregations, I pray in the name of Jesus that, Lord, your church will hear your voice and not, not be repelled by it, but be attracted to it. Give us a divine curiosity where, where we will pursue you with everything we've got. God, take that tongue off the, that coal off the altar and put it to our lips tonight. And for the last time, Master, I'm asking you to burn out of us the stuff that has been resistant to you, the stuff that could, could lead us in the way of Adam. God calls us to, to repent and to turn from our wicked ways. And Lord, as we cry out to you for this nation, for the nation of Israel, Lord, we see the storm clouds gathering, and we know we've got sons and daughters in harm's way that, 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 that they may give their lives. And for what purpose? God, I'm asking you tonight, Lord, would you stir up the church again? Breathe life into your body. And let us begin to live for heaven's purpose. Give us, grant to us, the church and us in this nation, grant to us a fresh, a genuine revelation of Jesus, the Messiah. I ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Guys, if this doesn't move you to pray at an altar, then I've got nothing else to say. God bless you.